Pow! Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to a Break to the Usual Format. I'm on my own uh, reviewing Todd Phillips' new film, Joker, which everybody's talking about. Uh, I appreciate I'm probably a bit late to this because I saw it last Friday. I meant to review it on Saturday, I think. I just didn't have the time. So I finally got the time, so I thought I'd make some effort and do some nice lighting and all the rest of it. Um, whilst we're here, quick shout out to this video's sponsor, our new sponsor, and that's Sniffing Glue. <laughs> So, a uh, little bit uh, of stuff at the top of this. There will be spoilers. So, if you don't want to hear spoilers, I'm going to give you about a minute of my thoughts before I get into that territory. Uh, I really liked Joker. It was a big surprise to me. As uh, I will put the link below for our discussion. Duncan and I had a kind of trailer discussion a while back. I couldn't really see the point in it at the time. Um, and we talked about that for half an hour. <laughs> uh, I was wrong. Um, I really liked it. Uh, I think what they've done here, obviously it was $55 million. So they're in that kind of Deadpool type of money, Deadpool 1 money, whereby you kind of make something a bit riskier, kind of R rating, and then you kind of pump it out and hopefully it gets a bigger return. This film feels like a $55 million film. $55 million is a grotesque amount of money by anyone's estimations. And I think it's kind of disgusting that we look at that as being a cheap film, but there you go. This is kind of a mid budget film. It feels like it. It's very low on spectacle, which I liked a lot. In fact, um, there's a bit of kind of spectacle at the end that sort of disappointed me. This is a very kind of street level, unfussy, intimate story. It's kind of quite light on effects and stuff, as you might imagine. Um, really good period setting. I think they've nailed the period setting really well. Um, in terms of the costuming and art direction, it's really, really, really nicely done. Um, I, I've been told it's 1981. I don't recall it specifically says that in the film unless it's on the kind of top of a newspaper or something, for there are many newspapers to be had in Todd Phillips' film Joker. Um, the camera work and the editing is very unfussy. I like that. It did kind of feel like a 70s film in that respect, in that it didn't really mess around. There's lots of kind of trucking shots and a few kind of jibs and stuff like that, and some dolly stuff. A little bit of handheld, um, reasonably long takes by the modern standard, which I really liked. The story felt like it was allowed to breathe. Um, nice variety of kind of focal depths in it as well. Um, the colour palette is probably as you expect from the trailers. It's in that kind of 1970s, 1980s kind of brown, green, beige look, opposite to the sort of Suicide Squad thing that I'm doing here. Um, and if anything, my kind of main problem with it was, say problem, kind of didn't necessarily have to be a Joker film in my view. I sort of feel like if you just did, uh, did a film on the same scale, I mean, if you took the Batman stuff out and substituted it with other stuff, it would still kind of work. But I suppose, and you probably could have made it for about 5 million instead of 55 million and you wouldn't have had Joaquin Phoenix. Um, but I think that's kind of a shame. I think there's a really good story well told here. And it's about a man driven to madness by systemic avarice, basically. You've probably already heard that. Um, Joaquin Phoenix is someone I like. You know, his finest work remains to be Space Camp. Just space camp, mate, it's great. But um, he's really, really good in this. And, uh, you know, he's done one of those kind of worrying physical transformations whereby, you know, like how Tom Hanks ended up getting diabetes because he kept getting fat and thin all the time. Like he's worryingly thin in parts of this, but it's kind of the point. Um, that's it for our kind of non-spoiler discussion. I really liked it. A lot of people don't. It's not amazingly groundbreaking. It's not incredibly clever. Um, it's got a, a lot to say, which I liked. I think there's a lot of subtext in it, you know, not particularly subtle, but it's there. And, and it was kind of quite a fun, not fun, but interesting, engaging watch. If you are in a kind of dark place mentally, you know, if you kind of have mental, mental illness problems at the moment, if you're kind of in a slightly dark spot, I'd probably leave it for a while because it takes all that kind of head on and it's really quite unpleasant um, on, on that basis. So there you go. If you uh, don't want spoilers, fuck off. <laughs> anyway, um, so we have Arthur Fleck. Arthur Fleck lives, lives with his mother in Gotham. Gotham is uh, Paul Schrader's New York. You know, it's, it's the New York of Taxi Driver dressed up as Gotham, so this is very, very much your kind of Elseworlds take on Gotham. Uh, I've spoken before about how Zack Snyder's Man of Steel does a kind of Randian version of Superman, which I don't think is appropriate. I think doing Gotham as kind of straight as New York, I think is kind of appropriate and it sort of works. Plus, when it's compartmentalised as an Elseworlds thing, fine, have do. Man of Steel was the new Superman and was marketed, you know, all the kids and cost millions and millions of dollars. So, you know, they don't quite stack up, it's apples and origins 
apples and oranges in that respect. Um, but it very much, yeah, is set in that world. So Arkham Asylum is Arkham State Hospital. Uh, you know, you see kind of yellow taxis. They refer to Wall Street at one point as well. Um, so it very much kind of moves within that world. Uh, the of the obvious influences then are Taxi Driver, King of Comedy, Network. Um, is very much in that kind of area, which I think we all knew going in. I know Scorsese was attached to this as executive producer, but I understand buggered off at some point. So I don't know what that's all about. So our proto joker is Arthur Fleck, who's like a clown for hire, who uh, has his funding taken away from his medication. He discovers lots of revelations about his life and it drives him into madness. At the same time, uh, when he kind of comes off his meds, he commits some murders, which inspires a kind of big movement, and that all kind of coalesces and comes to a head at the end of the film. Thomas Wayne is... This is the, probably the most unsympathetic version of Thomas Wayne I've seen. Um, probably the next one down would be uh, Flashpoint Batman. Well, I'm not saying it's totally unsympathetic, but, you know, he goes around killing people and is a nutbag. Uh, this one is a kind of... God, dare I say it? A kind of vaguely Trumpian version of Thomas Wayne. Um, and a big kind of component at the centre of the film is the class struggle, uh, and that's kind of played out writ large. Uh, basically, instead of falling into acids, um, the funding is cut from Arthur Flex medicine and he goes mental. Uh, his mother was previously in the employ of the Waynes and she tells him that, Tom, she, that he is the illegitimate son of Thomas Wayne. And, you know, that happens about a third or halfway into the film as a kind of revelation. But you're given enough reason to doubt that. Uh, and it turns out not to be true, basically, which I really like that as an entanglement because something that I'm not mad about, for example, in the Tim Burton Batman is the Joker directly killing Batman's parents or Bruce Wayne's parents. Um, in this way, he's kind of indirectly involved, but he's got this kind of personal connection that's actually one removed. So his mother was a psychotic delusional who abused him as a child, and that's led to his kind of his adult problems, which led him to murder, well, murder some Wall Street guys and then kick off a kind of quasi revolution. Um, I, some of the more interesting stuff in it in relation to comic book kind of things is that um, obviously the Joker origin story the one that people look to all the time since the 80s is uh, Alan Moore and Brian Bonin's The Killing Joke now this is not that and it doesn't do that the fact of Arthur Fleck being a stand-up comedian and the kind of Joker proto-Joker character in Killing Joke being a stand-up comedian is there but tonally it's very different I mean um the Killing Joke comic, at least, dresses everything up in that kind of out-of-time, anachronistic Depression-era look with big fedoras and stuff like that, which is what Tim Burton did. This is, like I say, very much 70s and 80s. Um, in terms of other comic book stuff, I noticed, uh, it does reference, really, The Dark Knight Returns, which is obviously um, Miller, Janssen and Lynn Varley. Uh, and there is actually a scene where you have a kind of grid of television screens kind of pulling out. And that's very much, you know, Frank Miller was very preoccupied with showing television screens, which is something he does repeatedly throughout uh, that comic. And it happens here. The, the concept of viewership and separation of, you know, viewer and, you know, presenter or broadcaster through a screen is done time and time again. And one of Arthur's delusions is that uh, the character played by Robert De Niro, the, the chat show host character, is kind of, he views him as like this kind of surrogate father and he hero worships him. Um, of course, Joker on a chat show is directly from The Dark Knight Returns. We all know how that went. Something that I was really kind of interested in is, is in the third act. So basically Fleck goes on Robert De Niro's chat show and he shoots De Niro in the face, murders him live on air. Um, and that kind of put me in the mind of the real life televised tragedy that you had in the 70s and 80s of things like Arbad Dwyer, Arbad Dwyer's suicide or Christine Chubbuck, the newsreader that shot herself on air. There's that kind of thing of a broadcast, a live broadcast traumatising a group of people and they do a thing where it pulls out through the screen and obviously Joker has a kind of big diatribe thing in the middle there. So um, yeah, in, in summation, this is not a very long review but it is a review and that's the most I could say. And I've spoken very, very quickly. So if you want to go down to that little thing in the bottom and just slow the review down, please fill your bits. Um, I really, really liked Joker way more than I thought. Um, will it stand up to repeated viewings? I don't know. I've got to say, when I came out of it, I was like, that was really great. I've had about a week for it to percolate. And now I'm a little bit like, well, yeah, it was great. But was it that great? I still really liked it. I'd recommend go out and see it. My only caveat is if you're, again, and I'm 100% on the level of being serious about this. If you're not in a great place right now, if you're a bit depressed or anxious or something, 
probably don't wait till you're a bit on more of a bit of more of a kind of level pegging before you go and give it a crack because uh it's fucking bleak mate it's and it's dark as shit i mean probably nothing you haven't seen before but it really goes in hard on the mental illness stuff which is kind of timely really because there's clearly an epidemic of horrific mental illness in in 2019 so there you go Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I've ranted and rambled for quite a while. Uh, I'm going to come back and do another one for Terminator Dark Fate, which, you know what? I've been laying into Dark Fate for ages because I've seen nothing that's impressed me. Uh, I would like nothing more than for Dark Fate to be really good. I said that with the Robocop remake. I say for all this stuff, like I don't want this stuff to suck. It just inevitably always does. So I'll be back with Terminator Dark Fate. I hope you enjoyed this. Like, subscribe and all that shit. And I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Support your 7th or 8th favourite YouTube channel by buying crap, tat, junk, hogwash and filth at redbubble.com slash people slash Valverde shop.